Well, if I thought that, uh, gee, there should be more people here than that. There should. Okay. Uh, if, I, <clears throat> if I thought that 6002 was purely about electrical circuits, I wouldn't be so I impressed with making everybody in computer science, for example, take 6002. But 6002 is more important than that. Okay? The T, electrical circuits are a uh, gorgeous language, an intellectual powerhouse, a language for describing the world. What I mean by language is something like this. Okay? Languages are built out of primitive elements, means of combination, and means of abstraction. What I mean by a language is that I can make things that are compositions of primitive elements, and the objects that I form are themselves just like the primitive elements and that they can be composed to make bigger things. So for example, in uh, electrical circuits, the primitive elements here are things like resistors, capacitors, inductors, independent sources, and things like that. The means of combination is you can connect the terminals of elements together uh, to form nodes, and the, the laws associated with that, which we can understand, are Kirchhoff's laws and things like Telegin's theorem, I suppose we haven't told you about, but we could have. And the means of abstraction are that I can make bigger boxes that are equivalent to the boxes that have lots of pieces in them for the purpose of describing their behavior of terminals. Okay? We have examples of that for linear systems of Thevenin and Norton and I suppose two ports, port boxes. So that's a, a very important idea. That's a language. Okay? What I'd like to show you today is how we can apply that language to understand what's going on in something you probably know nothing about. Now you probably have never thought very much about a mechanical watch. Uh, how many people here have watches that tick and talk? Oh, there are a few. Amazing. OK, well, that's not very, that's not very common anymore. But we have, how do we know how it works? Let's try to understand how something like that works. Well, there are a variety of approaches to understanding how something works. Okay. I suppose the very beginning of such an approach is to think about anatomy. You know, what are the pieces out of which it's made and how are they hooked together? Okay. And so I suppose uh, if we start out with anatomy here, uh, we could say that there are things like, well, here being a, a watch itself, looking at it a little bit easier to see, it's lots of parts, you see. It's got parts that are complicated. It's got, uh, it's got lots of gears, gears. It has uh, little screws. It has bearings. It has some funny kind of wheel over here. Okay, it's a, a big complicated mess. So we can take it apart like a dissection. Okay? Suppose that we dissected it. We'd see lots more parts. Okay? We'd see things like, like that it happened to have a case, which I've already taken off this watch. Okay? You could see that it has a main plate and maybe a face, which is a display. It has hands. It has some uh, other little things that we can't tell yet. If I take it apart further, we find, well, on the dial side, there are more parts and lots of names for these parts. Okay? And this is not very illuminating. That's a general problem with anatomy, but it's necessary to be, when you start out with something to begin to get familiar with the parts. It gets a little more complicated on the back side. Uh, G, uh, here's the, here's the uh, main movement side of the watch. I suppose I should put it this way, although it doesn't matter. Okay? It's just, just as mysterious one way or the other. But basically, by golly, there are lots of parts here. And not only that, there are some screws that are so small in, say, a lady's watch that it's not too hard to inhale one. Okay? I've done it okay? when taking one apart. <laughs> so there. It doesn't seem to matter very much. Uh, watchmakers tend to inhale parts all the time. <clears throat> and that's one of the ways they disappear. And they have lots of names, right? There are names for all these parts, none of which you should know anything about. Ah, so I suppose the first thing we want to do is try to organize this information. And I suppose when we deal with anatomy, after we've done some dissection, we have to put it back together and say how things are hooked together. So the thigh bone's connected to the hip bone, and the hip bone's connected to the backbone, and things like that. Okay, and so what we have in a watch, just looking at the parts, there's bigger parts. There are, there are main, main organizations 
There is something called, I call the oscillator, which consists of a balance wheel and a, and a hairspring, and the, those have pieces. And when I have these little lines around things, that means that they're sort of connected together. Okay? There's a section which is the escapement, which connects together a roller and a lever and an escape wheel somehow, which is the wheel, the escape wheel is part of something called the wheel train, which is a big long streak of sequence of wheels, an escape wheel, a fourth wheel, a third wheel, a center wheel, and a main wheel. Interesting. And they have funny names. A lot of these things are 300 years old. Okay, and then there's, there's attached to that a display, and then there may be attached to something which moves the display around, and then there's a source of power here, which is a mainspring. Okay, and that's a, a lot of, at least I have an organization of how things are put together now, although that doesn't tell me very much. Okay. How do you begin to understand something that's complicated that you don't really understand by just the way it's put together? I suppose the next step is to think about not anatomy, but physiology. Okay. Physiology is the, the, the abstraction built on top of this. This is one hierarchy you're seeing here. You're seeing here a hierarchy of groupings of little pieces. Okay. It's the same thing as saying, well, there's a stomach connected to, a, uh, connected to an esophagus and an intestine, and that's called a digestive system, but you know, it doesn't tell you anything about how it works or what it's for. Okay. I want to know about physiology, which is the stomach is the first stage in the digestion of proteins. Okay, and think of it that way for, uh, for actually assimilating proteins. It's an example of what it's good for. Okay, here. This is something about the physiology of the watch. Okay? The, phys the, the watch has a, it basically has several parts that are, that are magic. There is an oscillator, which we will look into shortly. And the oscillator, the oscillator is going to oscillate at a, a uniform rate. In fact, you see right here uh, in the picture of the oscillator right there, you see something going back and forth, a wheel, a balance wheel. And you actually see a little spring going, breathing. Right? That's a hairspring. And the hairspring restores the balance wheel. There's an inertia of the moment of inertia of the balance wheel and a torque produced by the hairspring. And this is, a, this is an oscillator very much like an L and a C and an R, okay, an inductor, a capacitor, and a resistor. So the oscillator is going to have to be sensed. So we know if we can count the oscillations. The same way we measure distance, we have a ruler. A ruler is something, where we, a piece of, of, of rigid material that we lay out with equal space intervals of space. Right? And we, count, we measure space by counting the intervals. In the same way, the way we measure time is by counting the oscillations of what we believe to be a uniformly spaced in time oscillations. Okay? So right over here, we have a means of sensing it, which we have to get into. Okay? That has to be scaled because this oscillator is going two and a half cycles per second. That's five ticks. If you ever look at a mechanical watch, you listen to it, most of them are going five ticks per second. Because each way, each, each half oscillation goes tick, and we'll find out why shortly. Okay, so there's a scaler, and then something which manages to display the, the count okay, that's being taken in that scaler. The other thing we see here is that, of course, this oscillator has to be kept going. There's friction everywhere. If I start up an RLC circuit, okay, then eventually it dies out, and there's no, there's no operation. There's no more oscillation of it that we can sense. Okay, so there has to be some way of putting the energy back into this oscillator so that it keeps going. And so what we're going to do there is going to have to start out with some energy source, and then we're going to have a transmission mechanism which brings, the, brings that energy to the oscillator, and somehow it has to do it in some clever way so it doesn't disturb the timing. That's the great trick. Okay, so that's what we have to understand. <clears throat> Now, just to give a little feeling for the various parts of this system, okay, now that we understand there's an energy source, well, here's the energy source. The energy source is a rather large helical spring called the mainspring. Large meaning it's about, I don't know, in this watch, mm, a half inch in diameter. Okay? There's a, there's a uh, helical spring wound up in a barrel. A barrel is a, is a, is a brass device with some, with some gear attached to the outside, and then there's a, uh, an arbor running through the middle. I'm using all sorts of words that you don't know. I know that. Okay? <laughs> arbor meaning a, meaning a staff of some sort that grabs onto the spring. Okay, that is hiding underneath this gear, 
which is used for winding the watch, and it is the energy is stored by winding up this spring. <clears throat> when you oh, take apart a watch, it is very important that you first make sure there's no energy in that spring. <laughs> Otherwise, you end up, so it has to be wound all the way down. Otherwise, you end up with a very large number of broken parts, and maybe most of them lost because it was flying apart. Now, the next thing is that unlike the nice physiological diagram I drew you, there is, like almost every good engineered system, there's overlap. There are several purposes for many parts. Okay? In the case of a, of a watch, the transmission of we the wheels that transmit power from the barrel to the oscillator happen to be overlapped with the wheels, they are the same wheels, that are scaling the rate for the display. And in fact, very good engineering often overlaps these things, contrary to what they teach you, say, in 6170, okay, where you don't want to overlap it. In computer programs, the cost of extra instructions is small, but the, co the, the cost of something you can't understand is very large. So it's a very big difference. So you have to be very careful not to pull that part of the engineering from one place to the other. However, what you see here is a sequence of wheels, each of which has a, a certain number of uh, gear teeth connected to pinions, which put turn the next wheel, so that, for example, the center wheel goes around once per hour. The fourth wheel goes around once per minute, and that's where the second hand is attached. Okay? And then there goes this funny-shaped escape wheel, which we'll talk about, and some sort of very strange object which connects to the oscillator. That's the way the oscillator will be sensed and the way energy will be put in. That's called the escapement, and we'll see that later. Um, looking a little more carefully at this, <coughs> If we take a particular watch, a uh, bull of a 10 AK, here's the way those wheels are laid out in, the, in three dimensions, just to give you a feeling for the, the layout. Of course, the entire distance from here to here is something like three quarters of an inch, maybe for a 10 AK. And it's pretty, these are very small objects. Of course, for those of you who, know, who knows what an Accutron is, anybody here know what an Accutron is? There's somebody with an Accutron. An Accutron it has a wheel in it that's 300 or 360 teeth, depending upon the model, and it's 0.093 inches in diameter. So in order to actually clean the teeth, you have to do it under a 30-power micro microscope. That's a, you can't even see them. So these are very, very small. How they manufactured that, I don't know. But there's a, there's a piece of, uh, of the, the layout of such a thing. And if we look at it uh, from the side, this is indeed a, a bull of a 10 AK movement. If you look at it from the side, you see that there are these plates that support the gears. There are bearings. The bearings are jeweled bearings for reasons we'll talk about later. There are jeweled bearings here. And then there are these wheels. This is the center wheel. Then there is the third wheel, the fourth wheel, the escape wheel. Uh, can anybody tell me why this drawing is a lie? What's wrong with this drawing? Quick, there's something very wrong with it. Somebody, the, the artist, the artist yeah. is a crook. Hmm? The aspect ratio is wrong. Well, that's sort of plausible. Okay. Okay, I'll tell you. These, we these wheels are not collinear. There's no way I could have cut the watch so I would see that. Okay, this is a, so you know, one of the things you should be eyeballing when you see, see engineering drawings is whether or not somebody is cheating you for uh, what, what reason. They may be doing it for an instructive reason, as in this case. <clears throat> okay. Anyway, the center of the watch is the oscillator, so I want to zero in on that. Let's start talking about the oscillator. Nice way to look at it. Okay, let me take this one out and show you. <clears throat> so we're going to do some surgery on this poor watch. <clears throat> Much surgery has been done on it before. It's used to it. It won't complain. Okay, so here comes the oscillator. Here it is. I'm going to put it on what's called a balance tack. Just make sure I just get that screw out of there. There's the screw. Okay, here we go. So what you see is a relatively massive wheel. You can see the size of it compared with my fingers. It's, my fingers are fairly small too, but these are, these are uh, rather small. And this uh, contains you can see that this is a, it's on a spring, such that if I wiggle it like that, it goes back and forth. Okay? Let's see if we can model that in a mathematical way, first of all. 
Okay? We all know how to do this kind of, of thing from 801, I hope. And what we have here is, <clears throat> see, here's the line where people can't see anymore, I suppose. Okay, imagine that I have some abstraction of this, which is a dash pot, and that's something with, a, with, a, with viscous friction, a spring. Okay, I'm going to connect the dash pot's piston will connect to the end of the spring. This is all, of course, the kind of nice magic nonsense that's drawn in physics diagrams, of course, where you, you know, one thing you might do, you know, frictionless devices, massless devices, you know, spherical cows, that sort of thing. But in any case, <clears throat> I have a, a mass here, okay, and I'm going to pick from this wall a distance Let's assume that this is the equilibrium position of, the, of that, that spring, and of the mass, excuse me, and this is the displacement from the equilibrium position, x. Okay? Well, we know that the force on, this, on, the, on the mass is minus k times x, that's the spring restoring force, minus v times dx dt, where if this is the viscosity or whatever it is of the, uh, of the dash pot, this has got a spring constant k of the spring. Okay? And that happens to equal, of course, the mass times the acceleration. Okay? This is what we learned in 801. Okay? And therefore, I could, by combining these equations, get m d square x dt square plus b dx dt plus k x equals 0. Oh, this is, looks very familiar. This is a second order linear constant coefficient ordinary differential equation. Okay? I think you supposedly have some experience with these from this class. Uh, better have some, I think. In any case, we can see a, a very similar device. Uh, supposing we had an electrical circuit that looked like this. I have an inductor, with an inductor inductance L, and I'm going to look at the current I. Okay, I have a resistor with a resistance R and a capacitor with a, capaci with a voltage across it, V, and a capacitance C. Okay, and I can write down the equations of state for this. The, that's L di dt plus Ri plus V, that's Kirchhoff's voltage law, right, equals zero, and C dV d Whoops, that was, yes, that's right, dv dt equals i. Okay? Combining these state equations together, I can get L d square v dt square plus r dv dt plus 1 over c times v equals 0. We know how to solve equations of this sort. Certainly from this class, we already know that, for, that, that no matter what's going to happen, independent of anything else, okay, assuming that this resistance isn't too big, as we've got an underdamped system, then the voltage over here, the voltage is A times E to the minus sigma T times cosine omega dT plus phi, where A and phi are determined by the initial conditions and sigma and omega d combined to make the natural frequency, s equals sigma plus or minus omega d times j. Okay? Those are the natural frequencies for this system, and those are determined by the resistance, the inductance, and the capacitance only. Okay? Okay, so you know how to do that. Oh, but what's interesting, these equations are the same. Okay, there's a very simple connection between them, an analogy, and the analogy that we see here is that x corresponds to the, vol the voltage, m corresponds to the inductance, b corresponds to the resistance, and k, the spring constant, corresponds to 1 over c. Okay? So therefore, what is capacitance is like compliance of a spring. It's the opposite of, opposite of the spring constant, the stiffness, is something called the compliance. 
Okay, so this is a already somewhat of a of an understanding. And what do we understand further than that? Okay, we have problems. We have, remember, we have the problem of keeping this poor thing going. Okay, that's what I was worrying about before. Okay, you notice it stopped. The fact that I wiggled it around, you know, it runs out of zap. Okay, there's always air friction and things like that. A, and it's very active, sensing it eats some, eat some energy too. So we have to figure out some way to connect this up so that the energy is not, is not lost. We have to replenish the energy and we have to sense the, sense the vibrations. Now I want to be a little bit more careful about this and say where is that energy going? So what if we go over to my, uh, my poor electrical circuit here and combine these differently? Supposing I combine these two equations differently. Supposing I multiply this one by i and this one by v and I add them together. Then I will discover, and I'm sure that you have already, that the derivative with respect to time of 1 half c v squared plus 1 half l i squared, that's the stored energy, the rate, rate of change of the stored energy equals minus r i squared. Okay? That's the power being dissipated in the resistor. You see how I, you know, of course, some of you have seen me do this before, but you see how I do this. I multiply this by i, this by v, add them together, discover that it's i di dt is the derivative of, one, of i square. Okay, one half i square actually. <clears throat> now, if I look at this picture here, if there were no resistance, this would be constant. Okay, the derivative would be zero and there'd be, this would be constant. If this is constant, then this would be an ellipse in vi space. So if I were to draw for you what happens in vi space, what you should see is something that looks like this. This is i, l, and inductance and v. Okay, I don't need an l there. Okay, what you should see is a spiral of the energy being lost, just like that in the state space. So we have to figure out how to get the energy back into the system. Okay, well that requires understanding a little bit more about this system. Okay, so let's go back in here and we'll get some more words and, and some look at the anatomy in some more depth. Okay, so what we had, we've already looked at the, the balance wheel itself. Okay, and that's the way the balance wheel is, is sitting on things. Okay, and of course they just pulled it out so you can see it. But the really place I want to concentrate right now is the escapement. Why is all my paper cover, slide coverage disappearing? Oh, I see why. It's because there is a fan which is blowing them away. How nice. Doesn't matter. Don't worry. Okay? It's just I've always been, I just, you know, the mechanism was interesting. What's going on here? Okay, so over here is a, is a, is a very strange mechanism with a wheel with very strange shaped teeth. This is called the escape wheel, and it's being driven by the, by the mainspring in the direction clockwise on this picture. Okay? But it's being stopped by these pallet stones, which somehow relate to what's going on inside the, inside, underneath the uh, balance wheel. Let's look at that in a little more detail. First we have to get some anatomy. Okay? Oh my gosh, this is looking underneath the poor balance wheel. It's got lots of parts, again. Uh, there, are these, there are these two stones, okay, I, I call them the entrance stone and the exit stone because the escape wheel is trying to move in this direction but it can't because it's stopped by one of those stones. Okay? The shape of these stones is extremely critical. Notice that it's something like a trapezoid, okay, very important. Also, this is a lever that's pivoting around this point. Okay? If it's pivoting around that point, then this, if it moves this way, then this moves this way. And notice that it has horns that wrap around a jewel called the roller jewel, which is affixed to a roller attached to the staff that supports the balance wheel. And that's, that's important to see. Okay. Looked at from the side just to give you a feeling for the side image. Again, okay. We have these, very, of course, there are very fancy jewel bearings, which I'll explain later. Okay, and then there's the hairspring that you see here. Here's the balance wheel cut off over here. Little special screws that are used for, for adjusting for temperature compensation. Uh, and then there's uh, the roller. There's a stone on the roller where there's a horn of the, of the pallet wrapped around it and then it's interacting with the escape wheel over here. 
Now let's go through the physiology. What's it do? And why? And how's it work? OK, so here's the story that's probably the most interesting story about watches. Okay. The story is that the mainspring is attempting to turn this way, turn the, the, turn the escape wheel in this direction. However, the escape wheel tooth is locked against the, what, the stone labeled R here, which I call the entrance stone. The balance wheel is being restored by the hairspring to its center position, and it's right, coming back this direction. It hits, okay, it hits the horn, this horn of the pallet. Okay? When it hits that horn of the pallet, it pulls the, this lever this way, okay? thereby unlocking this tooth okay, and causing the tooth now to press against the tilted face, the impulse face, of the, of the, uh, the pallet stone. In doing so, it forces this up very hard. Okay? Forcing it up means that the other horn of the pallet hits the, uh, the, impo the, 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 the roller jewel, and that's the tick you hear when the clock goes tick. Okay? That's the tick. Okay? And meanwhile, this, this, this thing continues pushing, and it, in pushing it, in fact, adds energy to the balance wheel's motion. Okay? And eventually, the balance wheel escapes on the other side. Okay, going, and it's gonna, this, this roller jewel is going to just pit, miss, the, miss that horn over there. But the escape wheel is now going to be able to move one tooth, and it gets stuck. So notice, we've accomplished, in, we've accomplished in one piece of machinery, made out of a few parts, both sensing the motion of the balance wheel, noticing when it goes through zero, the zero crossing, and putting energy into it okay, by a very clever trick. This is the kind of invention that if you, if you see it, let's say this way, if you come up with one of these, they're going to remember you for 500 years. Okay? I hope one of you does come up with something like this. Okay? And eventually, of course, this balance wheel will come back the other way okay, because it will be restored by the hairspring and we'll get the, we'll get the, other, the, the exact opposite phenomenon occurring where this tooth will become unlocked and then this one will be locked here. Okay? So this is, a, this is a marvelous invention. And I don't know who did the first one. Okay? We can actually see that right here in the watch, in the actual watch. Okay? You can look at it in some detail. And what you see, I hope you can see it. Let's see whether you can see it. I suppose you can, although it's not that clear up there. It's beautiful on my display here. I wish you had a display like this one. Okay? Here is the pallets. You can see I can pop it back and forth. Can you see that? Okay? And the, and, the, and the escape wheel is moving one tooth each time I do this. Okay? Another easy way to see this is I have a special device that was lent to me by my friend, the watchmaker in Stoneham. Okay? A big escapement. Okay. Okay. So here we have, this is, a, this is a, a demonstrator for teaching people about this stuff. Okay. Over here we have the roller jewel attached to a roller. This one I control with my fingers. Okay. The, as you can see, the escape wheel is now locked against this, this stone. Okay. If I were to hit the, the, this horn, then I will cause it to unlock, boom. Okay? And notice, by the way, when I let go, it goes boom, like that. It spins. Energy is put back in because what happened was that the other horn was, was, uh, was forced to hit the roller jewel. You can see it again by, by the escape wheel pressing against the impulse face. Well, I'm, not, I'm not letting it happen. Right? I, I didn't let it happen. But you can see it happen very slowly. Okay. There's this other part that I've not told you anything about, which is the guard pin down here. Okay. That happens to be for pre preventing a certain bug. Many engineering systems have bugs. Okay. And the bugs are discovered after they invented, and somebody has to make a patch. 
Okay, and we all know that engineering systems have these. And so this, this patch is to prevent um, the, the, the pallet from going to the other side when the balance wheel's in the wrong position. So there's a little notch here, a passing hollow it's called. You can see it. See that little, that little notch in the bottom of the roller? Notch over here. And so that, the, so that this, this action can only happen when the balance wheel's in the right position. And the purpose, the reason why this matters is if you vibrate the watch, like you play tennis, okay, it's going to, things, bad things might happen, you might get the, the uh, escapement on the wrong side. Okay, locking the whole watch up. Okay, so now let's get back to some electronics. Okay, and, uh, and Lorenzo will get ready, but I will uh, show you something. Okay, this can be modeled an electrical system, the escapement. It's a rather nice, interesting idea. <clears throat> because what I have is that inductor, the resistor, and the capacitor. Okay. One of the problems I have to sense, I said that the position is the voltage. Right? I want to sense the zero crossing is the position. Okay. So what I have here is a device which is going to send zero crossings. But we know how to do that. We have a high gain amplifier, a differential amplifier. An op amp will do. Okay. So if I say connect an op amp up like this, well then already we see that if this voltage is positive, then this op amp will be pinned down. If this voltage is negative, the, 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 meaning from here to here, then the op amp will be pinned up. Now, I don't want it to get quite pinned because that makes the op amp slow. So I'm going to prevent the op amp from being pinned by putting in a little feedback network here consisting of two diodes, which limits its motion. Those are the, huh. Those are these guard pins over here. See these two pins that limit the motion? This one and this one. <laughs> okay, that's the diodes. So I'm going to put them right here. <clears throat> Okay, and now I have something, if I look at what's going on here, supposing I've got an oscillation in the voltage like this, a sinusoidal oscillation. Then what I've got over here is a square wave coming out. Okay, it's going to be a square wave of plus minus 0.6 volts now, because that's the diode drop. And now, next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this into an impulse, because I want to hit the thing and make the tick. Okay, the tick and the talk. Okay. So, of course, to make a, these are little, these are, are approximately unit step functions, one after another. A derivative of those gives me impulses, okay, and presumably you've heard about impulses at least. So I'm going to put this into a differentiator, which consists of a, an op amp with a, uh, with a capacitor in series and a resistor feedback, okay. And now at this point, I have, I have impulses. Such that when this goes through a positive going zero crossing, the, this, uh, this produces a, a downward falling edge. That downward falling edge is differentiated to produce a positive going impulse. I take that impulse and feed it back into the oscillator. Okay, and now we have the equivalent of the uh, of the of the uh, of the escapement. Did I show it, Lorenzo? This is the uh, three trace version. <clears throat> nope, not that one. Well, that shows this. <laughs> in any case, okay. It'll take a while. Okay, I'll, I'll continue for a while while Lorenzo's getting this ready. <clears throat> but anyway, let's, let's consider what happens when I hit a, a system with an impulse. Now 
little bit more. OK. So supposing I have a voltage source. OK, and I'm going to use that to feed it into an inductor, a resistor, and a capacitor. OK. So here's the inductor, resistor, and capacitor. I have a voltage, and I have a current okay, into here. We already know the differential equation that we get from this. L d square v dt square plus r dv dt plus 1 over c times v is a over c times the impulse that I'm applying. Okay. Now what happens when I have an impulse? That's pretty strange. OK, thank you. There's what I wanted. OK? Good. Now we've got the right thing. OK? Just to give you a feeling for what this is, let's make it a little brighter just for a second. OK, it's bright. OK, fine. What you're seeing here at the top trace is actually the voltage across the capacitor. OK? Now what you're seeing at the, at the second trace is this voltage, which is the voltage after the zero, whoops, zero crossing detector. OK? And so you see the square wave such that the zero crossings of the, of the voltage on the capacitor are be turning into level changes. Why is the uh, video disappearing? OK, it's back again. OK. And indeed, the last bottom trace here is the, I knew we shouldn't have had video people around. The, um, the, uh, the bottom trace is, in fact, the, uh, the, the impulse is being generated, and you can see them, and they're in the, in the direction opposite that of the, of the level changes. Okay. One of the things interesting is that the top uh, picture is not a sine wave. Okay. It's not a sine wave, but it, in fact, it's almost one. Okay. There is, however, a change in slope at the time when the impulse comes in. This is important. Okay. I've particularly chosen a rather low-Q circuit so you can see this. Now let's figure out why this is ha was happening here. Going back to this equation, okay, if I were to say that the second derivative, if I were to take this, take this impulse and put it into the second derivative here, see if I put it into the bottom here, then I'm going to get all sorts of junk. Okay? So I'm going to put it over, over here, and I get the second derivative, just right after t equals 0, dt squared is something like a over lc times the, the, the impulse, delta t. Therefore, by integration, dv dt is something like a over lc times the unit step. Okay. Ah, but i equals c dv dt is uh, so. Therefore, that's approximately approximately a over l times u of t. So we see that the current takes a step every time an impulse comes in. Okay, and that gives us the size of the step. If the derivative is taking a step, then the, if I integrate once further, I get a ramp, and that's why I'm seeing a change in slope. OK? <clears throat> so uh, Lance, give me the next picture. Three, five, whoops. Thank you. OK, so what we see here, again, is now we're looking at the current as well. Okay, the, third, the middle trace there is the current through the inductor. And what you're seeing is every time an impulse comes in, the current takes a step. Uh, this is very important. Let's see if we can understand what's happening here. <clears throat> so, oh, let me use this one. So indeed, If I draw again in VI space, a state space of this system, what's happening? Well, of course, I would have gotten a spiral and losing energy. But instead, the trajectory of this is going like this. This is the trajectory, the orbit in the state space 
of the, uh, of the oscillator. Okay, I'm taking a step of current every time an impulse comes in, and the impulses are coming in exactly at the zero crossings of the voltage. And in fact, there it is. That's a nice picture of it right there. Thank you. Why are we choosing to put the impulses in at the zero crossings of the voltage? No, why are we hitting the thing in exactly this way? That's a rather remarkable question, but it's very important. It's exactly the reason why the clock, why watches work in such a way as to keep constant time. Okay. Let me show you. You see, the meaning of time, I wish I had drawn this nicer, but the meaning of time is this angle, is a rotating vector which is rotating with time. Okay. So this thing is going around, hopefully uniformly, in, the, in, in time. Now, if I were to accidentally put an impulse in over here, then I would get a step like this, which changes the time. Okay? It would give me a lag. And the lag would depend upon how wound up my mainspring was, how big the impulse was, how big the area of the impulse. So the crucial trick of making the impulse come in at exactly the time when the zero crossing of the voltage is occurring, or when the pendulum is going through the zero position, the center, or when the balance wheel is going through its center position, is because that's exactly the time which if I took a step in, in velocity, I would produce no change in angle, and therefore no change in the phase of the clock. And therefore it's independent of how much the where mainspring is wound up. There's another argument for that which is really important. Okay? And that is that, well, at the time when, let, let's see what happens when I hit something like a, a, a pendulum. Supposing I have Mr. Pendulum over here, okay, and supposing I think about, well, when it's up at the ends like this, it's going very slowly, maybe stopped. If it's going through the middle, it's going fairly fast, right? That's the maximum speed is when it's going through the zero crossing. And I'm hitting it in the direction it's going when it's going at maximum speed. What's the energy stored in that? Well, the energy, the energy is one half m v square, where v is velocity, in this case, not voltage. Okay, this is the energy in the pendulum or in the balance wheel. It's the, it's the angular velocity, and m is the is the moment of inertia. Okay, it's kinetic energy. Whereas all the energy is in kinetic energy at that time. There's none in potential energy. It's only potential energy if I'm up at the ends. So supposing I add in a little delta V, E plus delta E equals one half M V plus delta V square, and that's one half M V square plus two V delta V plus delta V square. Okay? Delta V is small, we assume. In this case, it wasn't so small, okay? That's because we had a very low Q circuit to demonstrate this. But this is the, so this term should be small by comparison to this term. If V is large, okay, at the maximum velocity, I get the maximum energy transfer by putting an impulse of velocity. Okay? And so this is a good way to get energy into that, that balance wheel or, or uh, pendulum or oscillator. Okay? <clears throat> Okay, well now, I've been talking about Q. And I said the Q of this system is very low. But we do a great deal of work in making watches to make the Q high. Why do we make the Q high? Let's go look just at what we do to make the Q high. Here's a part of a watch that you barely would think about. Okay. Looking at the bearings for the, for the balance wheel. Okay. There's a beautiful conical bearing here. In the particular watch we have here, the uh, diameter of this pivot is 11 one thousandths of an inch. Okay. It is going through a piece of synthetic ruby, a very, very hard material. 
called jewels. Watches have a certain number of jewels, 17 jewel watch, things like that. Okay? Going through a carefully shaped pivot, uh, through a hole, and then there's a cap jewel on top of it, and the cap jewel keeps the, keeps the uh, it limits the end shake. It keeps the, the balance wheel adjusted in vertical motion. Okay? The whole jewels keep it from tilting. Why would we use such fancy things? And furthermore, we use very small amounts of oil. The oil is minuscule and very fancy oil. The kind of oil you use for a watch, say, costs 30 bucks for an ounce. Okay? Lasts you, of course, a lifetime of a watchmaker. Okay? You use extremely tiny amounts of oil. The oil all stays right there. Okay? So there's a lot of effort that's put into making an extremely fine, uh, extremely fine bearings. <clears throat> if you look at that bearing, here's the capstone, the cap jewel, and say the whole jewel. Okay, and then there's a pivot that goes through. Actually, the pivot doesn't touch anything. Because right in here is the blob of oil. And the blob of oil is so small that the curvature of it is large. And the surface tension is so large as to put a high pressure, many pounds per square inch, which floats the, uh, the, uh, the pivot. So this really is a good bearing. It's a high pressure bearing. That's what's wrong. If you put too much oil in the watch, it won't work because it won't float the pivot or it'll work lousy. And so the minimum, you have to use really, really tiny amounts of, of oil. So we put a lot of effort into that. Why do we care so much about the, about the Q? Well, you already know. And I wish I had a little more space here. I know what to do. I'll use up. Use up. The final review for you. Blackboard. <clears throat> you know it already because you know what frequency response looks like. If I have a high Q circuit, okay, then it has a very sharp magnitude diagram in the frequency domain. Okay? That means it only wants to oscillate at one frequency. If it's a low Q, you get something, in fact, that looks more, more like this. Right? It has a wider, the Q is, the Q is delta F over delta F, the frequency over the width in frequency space of the peak. So this is saying how much it cares about that frequency. A very high quality watch will have very high, high Q. It will have a very fixed frequency. The way you know whether a watch or a clock or something like that is good is by looking at the random walk of the, of the, of the rate. A good, for example, a good ship chronometer made, say, in the 1940s, which is about when they made the best ones by Hamilton, made 21s, has the property that it's a random walk in, in time of about a quarter, per sec, a quarter second per day under the conditions of the fact that the thing's vibrating, that the ship is wobbling around, that the temperature is changing, okay, all sorts of stuff like that. That's amazing for a mechanical gadget. And that's partly because of the fact that the Q is maintained to be ridiculously high. Okay. okay. So I'm going to put this poor fellow back together again. Okay, we should hopefully get it working. Or I hope it will be working. Can you see it? Let me make sure you can see what I'm doing. First, I want to pop the escapement into the right state. Then I want to take the appropriate tweezer to get it off the... This is a rather delicate operation. I have to get it under the appropriate center wheel. It into the appropriate hole. Did I get it right? Let's see. It may take several tries. 
because it's a rather trying situation doing this in a lecture after being wired. Okay, I didn't do it right that time. We'll do it again. Let me pop it back. Boy, you can see my hand shaking. That's amazing. Normally, my hand doesn't shake. But this is a property of lectures. Ah. Ooh. It's beginning to get in the right place. Put this in the right hole. Whoops. Come on. Come on. Ah. So let me put this back together. Thank you for being very quiet now. This is not easy. Put one screw back in and then the thing will be in, in a safe state to reassemble later. Okay, so I wanted to, look, this is not a six size ladies watch. If I, if I had one of those, I'd be in trouble. This is a big watch, it's a 16 size watch. Okay, specifically brought out for a lecture. You know, if you, <laughs> so you know, there's no, it, it, you should see what happens when it's a little watch. As, as I've said, most, most good watchmakers spend a considerable amount of their time on their knees chasing the parts that they dropped. <clears throat> If they've not spent time on their knees, they're not being doing enough watches. So I just want to give, I just want to thank the number of, of number of, of organizations for helping with this. Um, the pictures that you see came from a defunct organization, the Joseph Bull of the School of Watchmaking, and there was a um, training manual from which I copied some of these pictures. Okay. Unfortunately, defunct. Uh, there is a, a marvelous book, which I believe is out of print. By called the but actually it is in print. You can probably get it from the American Watchmakers Institute. Uh, it's uh, the Watch Repairs Manual by Henry Freed, who is a, one of the best watchmakers who ever lived. Okay, and he lived in Larchmont, New York. Okay, that's uh, so I want to thank them, and I want to especially thank Lorenzo, who has made it possible for the, there to be demos in this class. Okay, for this entire term. Okay, and that's it for today.